Good morning, church, and welcome to Palm Sunday worship. Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. You know, when that first palm worship took place, it was not in a building, it wasn't in a church, it was in the streets as Jesus rode into Jerusalem. And today we're not in the streets, but we're out off the streets in our homes. We're scattered because the church has left the building. But the church has never been the building. The church is people like you and like me who love the Lord Jesus Christ. And we, we give to Him our obedience. We give to Him our worship. We bring before Him all that we are and all that we have. And let's do that today. Father, we come in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We say, Hosanna. Lord, save us. At a time where there's so much need in our world, we cry out to you to come and meet us. And we invite you to come now. Come and fill this time of worship. Thank you that we don't need to be necessarily sitting close to each other. We are in a sense scattered and yet our unity is stronger than ever through the Lord Jesus Christ. Lead us in worship today as we gather in the name of Jesus. Amen. LAC family, we welcome you for our online live worship. Let's pray together and let's worship the King. Jesus, we welcome you here. We fix our eyes on you. God, in this time that is so uncertain and everything is shaken, we fix our eyes on the unshakable King and his unshakable kingdom. Lord, we worship you. You are on the throne. You're in control and you're worthy. That doesn't change. And so we give you our best. We, we give you a sacrifice of praise this morning. So LAC, let's worship him. Let's give him our best today. Let's fix our eyes on Jesus. Amen.
set us free today. You set us free, Jesus. We sing of your freedom today. Freedom, you have given us freedom. You have given us freedom. My chains are gone, we declare today. Freedom, you have given us freedom. You have given us freedom. My chains are gone. Come on. We sing it. Come on. Freedom. You have given us freedom. You have given us freedom. My chains are gone. Freedom. Freedom. You have given us freedom. You have given us freedom. My chains are gone. Resurrection power living on the inside, Jesus. You have given us free. Setting us free. We worship you, Jesus. Thank you. Amen. <laughs> Good morning, LAC. It's Palm Sunday, and we are going to celebrate the King by singing Hosanna, praise is rising. So get up and join us and dance as we <laughs> praise him.
What a wonderful morning this has been of worshiping and praising the Lord. I want to tell you a story. It was back in January, and the Lord spoke to me very clearly when I first heard about what was happening in Wuhan, China, and the, this coronavirus. God immediately spoke to my spirit, and he said, Fred, I'm greater than this virus, and it's going to get messy. But as you walk through it and as you lead your people through this time, declare my supremacy over this virus. He spoke it to me so, so deeply. Declare my supremacy over this virus. And of all things, a year ago, God put in my spirit to preach the book of Colossians leading up to and through Easter. And the theme of the book of Colossians is the supremacy of Christ. Now, nobody is smart enough to figure that out, that that's what we need now, and that's the book God leads us to. We just finished the book of Ephesians, and Ephesians, and now we're into Colossians. These two books were written within months of each other. They were both written in Rome. They were both written by the same guy, the Apostle Paul. And of all things, they were both written to encourage two different churches, the second one going through what we could refer to as a pandemic. It wasn't a physical pandemic like the one we're going through today, but it was a moral pandemic. It was a philosophical pandemic, and it got to be a behavioral issue in the church. Now, I want to unpack for us the book of Colossians in an overview but we're focusing today on one verse. It's Colossians chapter 1, verse 18. In fact, only part of the verse, it's eight words. And here are the words. That in everything, he might have the supremacy. And it's talking about Christ. That in everything, he might have the supremacy. Now, the reason Paul wrote this book was because he had a visitor, a guest, who came all the way from out of town, all the way from the city of Colossae, near the city of Ephesus, all the way down to Rome in Italy. It was the pastor of the church in Colossae, and his name, of all things, is Epaphras. We are introduced to Epaphras in chapter 1, verse 7, where we understand here that Epaphras came and informed the Apostle Paul of the good and the bad. But in the middle of the moral pandemic, Paul had a message for the church. And then we're, we see at the end of the book, again referring to Epaphras in chapter 4, verse 12, and there it appears that initially, Epaphras brought the news of what was going on in the church to the Apostle Paul. And then after Paul writes the letter, he becomes the letter carrier to take it back to the church in Colossae. But what is the message? The message for this church that's experiencing a philosophical or what we would refer to as a theological pandemic, to the church that's experiencing a moral, ethical pandemic, they are experiencing uh, dishonesty, all kinds of corruption, and all kinds of a, a bad worldview had infiltrated the church. The message of Paul to the church in crisis in Colossae is the supremacy of Christ, that in everything he might have the supremacy. Now, when it says the supremacy, or as it says in some of our translations, that he might have the preeminence. The word preeminence or supremacy is the word that literally means to hold first place. To hold first place. It would be in the NFL, it would be to hold the Lombardi Trophy. For hockey fans, it would be to hold the Stanley Cup. Uh, for uh, those of us that love the Masters, it would be to wear the green jacket. 
Um, there are voted every year uh, who's the most eligible bachelor, the most beautiful woman in the world. All those awards uh, would be a first place award. And here it's saying that in every category, Jesus has first place. Now, I don't know if I've ever held first place, but I do have a, a sweatshirt that says the, the world's greatest papa. And I'm proud to wear that. Now, I, I realize when I wear it that there are probably 200,000 guys out there that all have one. And in fact, once I was wearing it and I bumped into a guy that had one. It was a little different, but it had the same message on it. It really didn't matter to me. I don't need to be the world's best. I just need to be the world's best in somebody's eyes. And in the eyes of a few of my grandkids, I think I may be uh, uh, the best or at least tied for first with my, uh, the one with whom I share a papa. But it's saying here that Christ in all things, that in everything he might have the supremacy. Now think about this. The supremacy. So he might not be the most popular on every uh, college campus or in every high school, but, but he would be the one with greatest influence, the one who deserves the supremacy over every high school, over every middle school, every primary school, over, over, over every industry, over every sports team. Uh, he's clearly the richest man in the world. Uh, he's the most likely to succeed. I mean, think of all the categories where Christ already has the supremacy, and the Bible says that one day, one day, it says that today, Christ has been given the name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. Those dirty dogs under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's what we're talking about. That in everything, he might have the supremacy. It's the message for the church in crisis. Whatever you're facing, if you've already been laid off of your job, you're worried about uh, whether or not you're going to get this disease, you may already have some symptoms, or maybe you've already tested positive, what's your future going to hold? I find today more people are concerned about their eternal state. Uh, we had one of our leaders in the church. He's a man who, who has been a leader in our church for many years. He's well respected. This week, he got a phone call from a man he hadn't seen for some time. The man was 91 years old and a leader in his church. He asked uh, the man in our church, he said, um, what would you tell someone who was in a, a, a nursing home and about to, uh, to face eternity? And our friend asked a few more questions and, and determined that the man was asking really for his own benefit. And he shared with him that Jesus Christ is the way to have eternal life. And that day, it was just this past week, that that man prayed to receive Christ and eternal life. And in his life, God became the supreme, the number one who held the, that trophy in this man's heart. By the end of the conversation, my friend asked his uh, older friend, he said, now, do you know for certain that when you die, you will go to heaven? And the man said, for the first time in my life, and he broke down, he said, for the first time in my life, I know for certain that when I die, I will have eternal life. You see, that is the supremacy of Christ. But what we find in the book of Colossians and really throughout the entire Bible is that life works best when Christ is in charge. Now Christ does not usurp that position of being supreme over your life any more than he usurps it over mine or anyone else. In a sense, God is a gentleman. He, he waits for permission. And, and yet he did something. And what we're going to see here in the book of Colossians in the days to come is what Christ did for us to earn the rightful place of supremacy over everything. 
No, Christ is the one who loves you. He's the one who died for you. You know, when we think about the supremacy of Christ and we think about what Christ has done, one of the most beautiful pictures, and our minds can't help but think of that statue that stands in Rio de Janeiro, the picture of the exalted Christ. It's a statue that's referred to as Christ the Redeemer. It's, it sits on top of the hill. It's a mountain. It's Mount Corrado. It stands tall on that mountain. The arms of Jesus on the, in, the, in the statue are stretched open wide. We all know the statue, but let me tell you the story. First of all, that statue was made by the church at a time when Rio de Janeiro and Brazil was overtaken by immorality and, and crime. There was godlessness. People were forsaking the, the faith of Christ. And they built the statue to draw people back to Jesus. In a sense, it was built in a crisis for people to look to. You know, in the Old Testament, there was a time when there was a plague, not of a virus, but of serpents. Snakes were rampant where the, the children of God were traveling. And they were being bitten and many were dying. And God had them build a bronze serpent and to be lifted up on a pole. And where that serpent stood, if people looked to that serpent, it, uh, they, they were healed. Now, in, when Jesus came, he said, even as they lifted up the serpent, so the Son of Man will be lifted up. And what he was saying is, what happened in one moment in time during a, pan, or a plague, uh, during being overrun with snakes, that's what I'm going to do for all nations, for all time. You can look to me for your salvation. And the Bible says, all who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. Now, <clears throat> the other factor of the Christ the Redeemer statue in Brazil is while it looks like it's made of white marble or poured concrete, it's actually covered with triangular-shaped tiles. And those tiles made of soapstone, cover the entire statue of Christ. In fact, there are six million pieces of tile that cover the statue. It's a picture of those of us on earth who have put our faith in Christ. That today, we are in Christ from all nations of the world who have put their faith in Christ, who have called on the name of the Lord to be saved. The scripture says we are now in Christ as represented by those broken pieces. Then his arms are held open wide. He forms a cross. If you look head on, it looks like a cross. The statue looks like a cross. But if you look at another, another way, and I'm going to just turn sideways here, the arms are cupped to some extent, and if you look at it from a certain angle, it's clear that the genius of the artist, the sculpture who created the, this statue, bent Jesus' arms forward as if saying, come, come, as if he's standing there waiting for an embrace waiting for a hug. It was Jesus on earth who said, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and you will learn of me, for I am meek and lowly of heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. No, you think of it. On the one hand, he forms a cross, and on the other hand, he is waiting for an embrace. He's waiting for a response. He sacrificed himself with no strings attached, 
But once he did, he did it to reach out to you, and he did it to reach out to me. It's a picture of the reaching of God's love and the sacrifice he paid to demonstrate that love. Now, the next part of the story of Christ the Redeemer is that both hands stretched out are holding items. In his right hand, Jesus is holding the cross, that which Jesus chose. He said to the Father in Gethsemane in the garden on the night before he was crucified, he said, if possible, let this cup pass from me, but nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. No, Jesus chose the cross for you and for me. It was his choice to lay down his life or to walk away from it, but he chose to voluntarily sacrifice himself for you and for me on the cross. But in his left hand, Christ the Redeemer's statue. Jesus is holding the globe, the world. Yes, the whole world is in his hands. But it's also the fact that when he chose the cross, he chose the world. He went to the cross for the sake of the world. And the same hand uh, that reached out for the cross reached out to take your sins. And the hand that reaches out to the world is there offering you forgiveness, offering you redemption, offering you a new beginning. For Christ to become supreme in your life, for him to have first place in your life, you need to give him your mess. You need to give him your broken pieces. The very fact that this statue is covered not with perfect pieces, but with with triangular shapes, jagged edges. It's a picture that God takes what we've given to him and he takes us in all of our imperfections. No, the hand of Christ is reached out to take the cross representing our sins and the world that he's waiting to redeem and those hands are extended to you. The statue is tall. It stands about 98 feet tall, but the arms are stretched open wide, wide about 92 feet wide, almost as wide as as Christ is tall. His arms are stretched open wide to you. And it was about 12 years ago that 100 million people voted on what ought to be declared the seven wonders of the world. Well, certainly the Great Wall of China, and there were other good selections, but among them was Christ the Redeemer, one of the seven wonders of the world. Well, that's fine, it's appropriate, but above the Great Wall of China, is the fact that when Christ died on the cross, he tore down the dividing walls between nations, between people and himself, and people from each other. No, the Lord is supreme. He has first place. Someone said, and appropriately so, the one who has Christ has everything. The one who has everything except Christ in reality has nothing. And the one who has Christ and everything has no more than the one who has Christ and nothing. Think of it. That in everything he might have the supremacy. I think of the words to the hymn written by St. Patrick. St. Patrick has been somewhat misknown. But St. Patrick was really not Irish. He was British. He was captured by violent slave owners and sold into slavery in Ireland. When he was freed at the age of, and he spent six years as a slave, After six years of slavery, 
he was released at the age of 22. And he had a choice. There was a lot within him that wanted to just go home. But first of all, God said, you need to forgive. If you don't forgive, you're never going to be free. And he forgave. He made a choice to forgive those that abused him. And then God spoke to his spirit, and, he's, and, and he gave Patrick a choice. You can go home, and I'll bless you. But if you want an, an adventure, if you want to see the supernatural, stay here in Ireland. And he did. He invested his life in reaching people for Christ in Ireland. In the course of his life, he led tens of thousands of people to Christ. He planted, and I, I researched this several times, and in several different sources, it all says the same. He planted not one church, not 10, not 20, not 100. He planted 365 churches. 365 churches all across Ireland. And before St. Patrick died, he led to Christ, the King of England. And he wrote these words. Christ be with me, Christ within me. Christ behind me, Christ to win me. Christ beneath me, Christ above me. Christ in quiet, Christ in danger. Christ in hearts of all who love me. Christ in mouth of friend and stranger. My friend, I declare over you, I declare over me, I declare over our community, over Atlanta, over our nation, over the world, that in everything, he might have the supremacy. Now, if you have been concerned about your own mortality in light of the death rate that we're now learning about through COVID-19, I want to point you to Christ the Redeemer. His arms are stretched out because he was crucified, and yet they're reaching out to you. In his one hand, he holds the cross because he chose the cross, but in the other, he holds what represents you. He holds the world. And won't you today open your heart and receive Christ? Receive the supremacy of Christ in your own spirit, in your own life, over your your present over your future, whatever it may hold, over your family, over your finances, over your resources, over your career. No matter what age in life you are today, I declare over you that in everything he might have the supremacy. There's no greater blessing. I want to give you an opportunity right now as we have heard the word, now it's time to respond to the word. And I want to give you the opportunity. Jesus said, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. God has warned us about this virus long before it has come. And Christ is supreme over this virus. Christ is greater than COVID-19. But in these circumstances that we're facing, God may have used the circumstances of these days to draw you to a full surrender of your life to the supremacy of Christ. Would you pray with me right now? Make this prayer your own. I'm going to say it so you can repeat it right where you are. Father God, I declare the supremacy of Christ I come to Jesus and I open my heart. I wasn't made to run my own life independent from God and today I repent. In some ways I've made a mess of things. But Christ came to take all the broken pieces of my life. Christ came to give me rest. And I open up the door of my life and I receive Christ in me, the Redeemer. Forgive me. Give me a new beginning. Restore my life. I receive right now forgiveness. I receive 
the supremacy of Christ. I put my life under the supremacy of the beauty of Christ and the redemption of Christ. Amen. Church, at this time, we're challenged in many ways, but God has been so faithful. God is stirring up shepherding like we've never seen it here in our local church and in churches all over the world. People are staying connected through, through uh, their devices and through much technology. And God bless Lilburn Alliance Church today as we give our offering to the Lord today. I want to just bless you for those that are giving through direct deposit or online giving or through the mail. Father, we pray that you would deliver us in this time from fear, that our, we would not worship with a clenched fist, but with an open hand, that we would continue to give to you generously, even as you have given to us. Father, we bless each other. We pray that you are our provider, and we ask you to provide for all the needs of our church family. And Lord, that you would receive the glory for those offerings that are given today and through the week to the honor and glory of Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's continue to worship him. Oh, the sun shall not smite thee by day, nor the moon by night. He shall preserve my soul, even
Church family, today is Palm Sunday, certainly a Palm Sunday that none of us have ever experienced or are used to. It's in Matthew chapter 21 that describes the triumphal entry that we celebrate today, where people are taking off their cloaks and throwing it before Jesus, and they're taking palm branches and throwing it before him, and they cry out, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna means Lord save us. Lord save us is an appropriate cry that we can call out today. We want to pray Hosanna today. Would you join with me right where you are in your home and say Hosanna, Hosanna, Lord save us. We want to pray for salvation to come across our land like never before. In Acts chapter 4 verse 12, it says that salvation is found in no one else except for Jesus. 1 John 5 12 says, he who has Jesus has life. He who does not have Jesus does not have life. We want to pray that across our land and across the world, people would trust in Jesus Christ in these days to receive salvation. Would you pray with me right now? Father God, we cry out, Hosanna, bring salvation across this land. Bring salvation to neighbors that we live near. Bring salvation to people that we work with. Bring salvation to family members who have yet to put their faith in Jesus Christ. And we cry out for salvation around the world, for unreached people groups in Japan, for the Fulani in Africa, for the Gujarati in India. We cry out, Hosanna, save them, Lord. We cry out, Hosanna, salvation to the Hindus, to the Muslims, to the Jehovah's Witnesses, the Mormons, the agnostics, the atheists. Lord, bring salvation to all peoples. Salvation is found in nobody else except through you, Jesus Christ. For you laid down your life for the sins of mankind. We thank you for this Palm Sunday. We thank you for Easter approaching next Sunday, that you are not dead, but you are alive, that you came to give life life to the fullest. We pray your life around us in Jesus' name and your salvation in these days. Well, church family, we're going to hear a good message coming up. But before that, we invite you to join with us in a good song. We worship you, Jesus. Mercy in your eyes 
to fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt. Church family, I want to invite you this Thursday night and Friday night to a special online Zoom service that we will be having to celebrate a Monday Thursday service, Thursday night at seven o'clock. It'll be an hour, seven to eight, and then a Good Friday service on Friday from seven to eight o'clock. It's a real easy way to interact and join with us simple steps in how to join via Zoom. If you are interested, we need to know, we wanna give you instructions on how to join with us. Email the church office, lacoffice 
at Lilburn, the number four, Jesus.com. Again, that's the letter L A C, and then spell out office at Lilburn, the number four, Jesus.com. Email that, and we will give you simple instructions on how you can join via Zoom. We hope to record this and broadcast it on Facebook Live, but would you join with us this Thursday night and Friday night from 7 to 8 o'clock? It'll be a special time to join together. Well, thank you for joining us for Palm Sunday worship. Hasn't it been a wonderful time together? You can close the, the doors of the building. You can put us on lockdown and keep us in our homes, but you can't touch the church of Jesus Christ because we're not bound simply by being in proximity to each other. We are bound across uh, the streets and from home to home through the wonderful bond we have in the love of Christ. Church, receive the blessing this morning. The Lord bless you, Lilburn Alliance Church, and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. In the name of God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen.